Great. So thanks everyone for coming. My name is Greg McKenzie and I'm a network coordinator at Climate Caucus. I'm based in the Algonquin Anishinaabe land, otherwise known as Ottawa. And today we have a packed agenda exploring managed retreat. We're joined by the executive director of Climate Atlantic, Sabine Dietz, Shannon Fernandez, manager of adaptation at Halifax Regional Municipality, and Gatineau City Councilor Anique de, de Marie. Sorry if I said that wrong. Um, so we'll start with Councillor Anique, who may have to jump, uh, jump off early to attend another meeting. And she's here to discuss Gatineau's um, buyout of Point Gatineau. Uh, so yeah, thank you for joining us despite such a busy schedule. And I'll pass it over to Anique. Thanks, thanks, Morag. And I'll, I'll do it in English, so bear with me if I don't have all the, <laughs> the right words. I, I used to work in English all the time in the public service, and now since I've been working in French all the time, I seem to lose my English. Anyway, um, so, and you let me know if I'm out of subject because I, and, and it's it's not my district that I, I'll be talking about, but it's a, uh, flooding that happened in, in Gatineau in 2017, and then there was another one in 2019. So I'll tell you about the history a little bit, then the program that was put in place by the, <laughs> thanks, by the Quebec government to uh, support uh, homeowner and tenants. And then I have a little presentation on the the master development plan that was created after that, and I'll tell you the challenges and uh, that we are facing uh, at the moment. Tell me again, uh, how much time do I have? Fifteen minutes. Okay, good. I'll go quick. <laughs> so you probably all you've seen in the news the flooding in seven two thousand seventeen and two thousand nineteen. Uh, the Gatineau is built uh, on the shoreline of the Gatineau River, so it was flooded on both sides in Gatineau and in Ottawa, or across the river from uh, from oh, those of you. So, and I I found a study that was done by ICLR Quick Response Program Final Report, so I can share that with you at the end. And I'm totally cheating and using what they wrote on this because I think it's responding to what you need to know. Uh, so they're comparing how um, the Quebec government reacted to flooding and how Ontario reacted. So basically, there was a program in, in Quebec to uh, help the homeowners where there were none on the other side of the river. So they could compare uh, the two, but I, I'll only talk about the get snow portion. So uh, there were two programs put in place, one after the other, to help uh, the one who chose to rebuild. And uh, if their house was not uh, destructed by mo more than 50%, the one that, that had houses destructed by more than 50%, and uh, there was a, a compensation that was given to them up to uh, $200,000 for the house and $50,000 for the, the land. So some, some people did use it. The one that was in the, uh, the how do you say that? The, one, the 120 portion, the 120 year floodplain. So everybody's familiar with that. I guess, and in this report, they explain very clearly what it means. <laughs> um, so, and then the second flooding, there was another uh, uh, program to manage retreat uh, by setting hard caps on the amount of comp compensation available to homeowner in flood zone uh, to encourage people to move elsewhere. The, the particularity of Point Gatineau, it's a very old neighborhood with a, a lot of disparity, mostly um, poor, poor family or poorer family, I'd say. And that may, be not, that may not be the right word to choose, but you know what I mean. <laughs> 
So it has it had major effect on their their lifestyle, their income, uh, their their way of life. So it did create great disparity uh, disparity and despair in the community. So uh, in two thousand nineteen. Uh, over 185 houses and uh, had accepted the buyout. So it means that the land came back to the city of Gatineau for $1. And, uh, but it did create a community uh, that is often called as a Swiss cheese pattern. So with, with spot of say, no houses because people had to destroy or uh, demolish their home and leave, leave the land to the, the city with the, by, I, the the compensation by the Quebec government. So, um, so what this study show is, uh, is that the post-disaster environment is a, is a chaotic time for, for people and the, it needs to be planned. The retreat needs to be planned, which wasn't done very much, but at least it was compensate, compensated with, like, there was uh, money compensation. Um, and if it's not planned, it, it, me, it, it leaves major gap, unmet community needs, and uh, what might be called unmanaged retreat. Um, Okay, so what was done after that, uh, knowing that the, that the community was left like that with the, 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 the if you have in your mind the, the Swiss cheese uh, <laughs> a picture of it, that it, it, it was a community that needed to rebuild and also uh, an environment that needed to uh, be ready for the next flooding. See, so um the city council that was in place at that time had really strong leadership so she did work with uh, an ngo the conseil régional de l'environnement de l'outaouais to uh, work with the community to plan a master development plan i think that that it's called or it's a loose translation i guess <laughs> Um, master plan for development of vacant land that I, I can translate. And they did like major consultation with the community, with experts, with the city administration, and they came out with a really good plan. And if I may share my screen, you should be able to. Uh, more. It should be a green arrow that says share. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, this one. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, that's where there were two communities that were flooded. The, the one I'm talking about is this one, Communauté du Ruisseau. Um, and then that's the other one. So there were more than 100 uh, uh, vacant land. So they did they did a like preliminary study, they, they did concept, and then the third fa phase was to to present the plan to the city council. So it was very thorough process and with different uh, working committee. Those are all the people that were consultant that they they work with uh, studio men they men that work apparently that were very good at uh, uh, preparing the plan and then what they came out with was a, a set of tools to to help the community define what the different piece of land would look like or what it would be used for. So some was like for nature, for places for people to gather in nature. The other one was for activities to happen more, more uh, of um, like, to, it's a bit similar to nature actually, but more 
um, the the goal was more for people to uh, to go to, and then the the uh, identify lands where they could there could be gardens or um, fruit trees or anything uh, for for growing food actually. Then there was another one to uh, permit people to access the um, the river. And then another one that would really be used as a sponge. Uh, so a place where to permit the water to, to uh, come in and be absorbed. So they came out with those five tools and then they identify on the map the different a piece of land and what they would be uh, used for. So that gives you a bit of an idea that the uh, the garden, the flooding, uh, and so it, it it was very illustrated as well to see what it could look, what it would look like, what it could look like. Um, and that I can share with you if you want, but you can see uh, what it could what it could be. So I think it will, and then they prepare also um, tools like that to see when when they did consult people. Uh, so very very easy to use tools to consult and to come up with a plan that would. Uh, be more consensual, I guess. Uh, see so a lot of illustration as well. Then this is how to prioritize the event when with it, what should be done first, what could be done first. Um, so yeah, so that gives you an idea of before and after how it could look like, what it could look like. So um. Then the plan was uh, uh, put forward to the city council for funding, of course, <laughs> and uh, it was accepted and money was put aside to start working on, on the, the first priorities. Uh, but then it's been like a year uh, or two years ago, some things were done, but mostly led by the community. Like there was a, um, a collective uh, community garden and now they will be planting a mini forest like a small forest uh, they have uh, beehives and but it's mostly um i'd say managed by the community and they, they are the one holding that little volunteer uh, volunteers that are doing that in the city the challenge of doing that, the plan is great and it gets nowhere great. We have a great climate plan, we have a great uh, forest management plan and all that, but implementation, implementation is quite a challenge. And I, I'm pretty sure you're all facing that, that uh, resources are scarce and, and the, the public servant are torn between the different priorities. So, and what happened is that one public servant that worked on the plan and was that was re responsible for implementing it at the urbanism service uh, got sick. She left for six months, so everything was kind of on hold. Um, so I'd say that the different challenges of, of uh, um, redeveloping a, a piece of land that was flooded is that, that you need really strong leadership. I think at the city council uh, level, the one that lives there, but that that would be also able to get the uh, the uh, the buy-in from the other city councillors to get the money to implement it uh, and, and be able to deal with the citizens that would like to rebuild where it's not like they can't or it's not a good idea or it's too risky. Um, the challenge is to work with the provincial government to, to get sufficient money also to to uh, support the citizen and also uh, be able to implement a plan. I mean, we don't have enough money to do that, to leave uh, undeveloped, uh, undeveloped um, 
a piece of land too where we're all looking for uh, additional revenues as, as cities. And uh, then you need also an, an administration that is really, uh, that, that you get the buy-in from the administration. The, the community, I think it, it happened there because the community is strong. They've been involved in their the, in communities uh, activities for a long time. It's a very old neighborhood. Um, yeah, so I think those were the the challenges that uh, that I that I saw talking to different people that were involved in the project. Thanks, Anik. That's a really yeah. beautiful study. It's like really well prepared and cool to see how they're planning on redeveloping this floodland for nature-based solutions. Um, since you have to jump off early, maybe we'll take one question for Anik, just so that we can get some feedback on this case study. Um, so does anyone, does anyone have a question ready to go? Yeah, Chris. Yeah, thanks. I've got a bunch actually, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it sort of looked like they had redeveloped parts of it like for housing is that the case and and if i can sneak one in like were people who didn't want to take the bite were they eventually forced to move or were some people allowed to stay kind of at their own risk um the, in order to be able to rebuild the, if their house was like if they were not eligible to the the buyout uh, the 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 um, how would I say the to get the permit to rebuild like the criteria were, were very uh, I wouldn't say difficult to achieve but you really had to add a plan for the next flooding to put your your electrical device uh, higher up uh, see things like that the mitigation strategy for for <laughs> the next flooding. So these people were able to to stay and rebuild. Um, some of them did ask for uh, how do you say an exception uh, to be able to stay. So they put the request in, but it took so long to get an answer or to get the approval of uh, it. It took like a, like six, seven, eight months. I can't remember exactly, but people had their house damaged. So at some point they decided to um, to uh, um, to demolish their home and go because they couldn't stand living like that anymore and not knowing. Uh, maybe one house actually, uh, a beer brewer uh, company did stay, uh, even if they it was like identified as a house to demolish, but he did stay and he got the um, he got the the no, sorry, I'm looking right. So he was granted the permission to stay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Um. Thanks for coming, Anik. And... Thank you. I'll stay until they call me back. Okay. <laughs> Thank um, you. So yeah, I'll pass it on to Sabine now from Climate Atlantic. She's the executive director and will give more of an overview of managed retreat. Mm, thanks, Morak. And thanks. That was actually a really interesting case study. So thanks a lot, Anik. Um, so just just briefly, because I see you're from across the country, so this is going to be a, a little bit a new thing. Um, so Climate Atlantic is a climate services organization. We're located and covering all of Atlantic Canada, including the four all four Atlantic provinces. Um, climate services organization means we support um, anybody who has any questions about climate data, climate projections, climate science, and climate change adaptation. Um, and we're a team of seventeen across Atlantic Canada. In 2022, um, we commissioned the report. So we also have a working group with the four provinces. I myself have been a, a municipal councillor, so I know the municipal world pretty well um, from the ground up. Um, and I've worked with municipalities as a consultant as well in, in New Brunswick, specifically on climate change adaptation, work planning, um, et cetera. So it is, it is a field that I'm very familiar with. And so we work very closely with four, the, the four provincial governments. And in 2022, 
after Fiona happened um, around that time, actually, um, we discussed at a sort of with four people who are who are intricate in the provincial governments around adaptation. But we can't really talk about managed retreat in Atlantic Canada, and that has multiple reasons. Um, one is that in our coastal uh, zone specifically, and I'm, I, this is probably the heaviest piece is the coastal zone. Um, there's a lot of tax revenue coming in. There's a lot of heavy lobbying that can happen along the coastline. We have so many, they're called cottages, they're mansions along some areas in our coastline. Um, so it is a significant tax revenue for coastal communities. Inland, it's primarily along the St. John River, where we've had some major floods. Um, and um, there it is not so much the cottages, although there are second homes for sure, um, but it is more um, probably focused on a, the, the, uh, the attachment that we all have to our homes, or most of us have to our homes in the coastline as well. But that is only for people who've been there for quite a while in the older areas and the newer areas. It's literally newcomers, people who, who, who build a second home in our, you know, arguably some of the most high risk areas that you could imagine in this country. And so we, d we commissioned this paper that you can find on our website, climatelantic.ca, under the tools, under resources and reports, um, looking at what's happening around that thing that's called managed retreat. Um, and so we asked a consultant to do this work for us because we just wanted somebody to do some research, looking at what are bio programs, what, is the poli what are the policies that exist across this country around managed retreat what has been done, what has not worked. Um, and we also asked her to include some of the, the principles that I think are really important to us as an organization. And I'll start on that. Uh, so Morag asked, what is managed retreat? Well, for us, managed retreat or managing the, the um, moving of infrastructure, homes, et cetera, out of high risk areas is part of the entire conversation around managing risk in high risk areas. So you cannot you cannot have a conversation. This is the principle. Um, you cannot have a conversation around adaptation in flood risk areas or along the coastal zone in erosion areas without also talking about moving things out of the way. You may not be able to do that right away, but at some point down the road, especially in the coastal zone, you will have to do it. And that is based on the data and the projections going forward. In our case, sea level rise, it will not stop. Um, storm searches will not stop and hurricanes in any case are getting worse. So our coastal at risk areas are likely under identified in any case, but in the conversation around, so what do we do about all of those risks? The idea of moving out of those high risk areas, it needs to be part of our box of tools that we have in our areas. Um, the problem is it hasn't been, it's not allowed to be there um, for the reasons of it being a hot politi a politically hot, hot potato, both at the level of municipal governments, as well as at the level of the provincial governments. Um, and I mentioned that already, and I saw, Nick, you, you nodded your head because I know, I know that's the case, and it's probably the case all across the country, but I just, I'm talking about Atlantic Canada, it's this case across Atlantic Canada. So managed retreat or managing, so giving the time, and if you mentioned that um, post-disaster um, uh, buyout programs are not really managed retreat. When I talk about managed retreat, it's the deliberate and long-term planning to move those pieces of infrastructure, houses, et cetera, out of those risk areas. That's why it's managed. You can still manage after disaster, but there's so many other things that are thrown in after a disaster. Um, that is a lot more difficult to do that in a, in a managed, deliberate and planned way. Um, our challenges are uh, particularly around what I already mentioned, um, money, um, the pol lack of political will. Um, and it's, it is a fact that the tax revenue for smaller municipalities around our shorelines consist of mostly those high cost um, uh, cottage developments that bring in a lot of revenue. Um, in our area in Atlantic Canada, we have across the board a very bad planning regime. So planning, um, you know, land use planning is actually a really good thing to manage risks and to manage uh, the impacts from climate change. But I'm saying that because I know enough, enough planners and I know planning in general is a really excellent tool that needs to also be part of the toolbox. And yet in Atlantic Canada, that tool is um, 
first of all, it is primarily used for continuing development, so allowing development instead of managing development. And so it is not particularly useful at this stage. It has done more harm than good at this time, uh, simply because in our municipal laws and community planning laws, um, development is a priority. It's not climate change yet. And so my last point that I wanted to make, um, I think my last point in this, in this place is that um, when we look at uh, managed retreat as part of this overall toolbox for adapting um, to climate change or managing, managing the risk from climate change, we're thinking about it in the long term. I just mentioned that. And that the fact is that in most cases, the way where we are in communities right now, it's all about fixing. Um, and communities have that, you know, either a political four year time frame, a strategic planning time frame, a municipal plan time frame that is very relatively short term. When I look at overall, um, you know, climate change, climate change is not a short term thing. And so in 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 reality, we need to we need to look at adaptation, adapting to that change, not on an individual basis in terms of piece of infrastructure that you have that you need to, you know, you need to build a bridge higher, you need to um, protect a road, you need to um, build larger culverts to manage runoff. So this is not the way we can look at and have to, and we should not look at um, uh, climate change and adaptation just with that lens, but we really need to look at climate change and adaptation um, as a process. So you can't, adaptation is not done when you have a climate change plan, a climate change adaptation plan, or when you've moved that piece of infrastructure even, or when you've put a larger culvert, a culvert in because you think you can manage the storm waters better, which you can. Um, but adaptation will remain a process. And so in this process that is over time um, where impacts will change over time. So we've already seen that we don't know exactly what is happening. We've seen it, hurricanes changing what they're doing, you know, hitting Quebec, hitting Ontario with their outliers, um, doing things that they've never done before. So that's a scientific fact. So if we think about climate change as something that's pretty unpredictable, um, it's not getting better. It's definitely getting worse for certain areas and that we need to continuously manage what we do in light of this change. So we should look at adaptation as a process. And when you look at adaptation as a process on a timeline, you will do different things. You will protect your shoreline, you will protect your infrastructure, but you can't stop there. You'll have to move forward and think about, okay, so yes, this will work up to a certain point, but what are the other things that are out there that I need to look at and manage retreat or managing the movement of infrastructure and at risk things in the way of these risk events uh, will have to be a priority. And that's not for tomorrow. That's why it's managed, right? It's a long term proposition. We cannot move pieces of communities in the short term. Um, it will take time. Um, it will take uh, political will at the provincial and, and, and uh, local level simply because it is difficult. And I don't think anybody says this is easy and it can't stop. So um, at Climate Atlantic, what we're trying to do, we're, we're trying to more and more talk about and bring managed retreat into our conversations with communities to make sure that they have that in their um, thinking as well. That, you know, um, no, I, I mean, in Atlantic Canada, we cannot build dikes and walls around our shoreline. Nobody can pay that. And I think that that's the biggest stop that, sorry, but if you have an 800 people community that is already being um, flooded by regularly by storm surges, then nobody's going to build a wall for your community because there is hundreds of other communities in the same position. So, and I'll leave it at that. Um, feel free to go on our website. You can download the report. It's available in English and French. It's already a little bit outdated because we're, we're progressing in our conversations and things do change over time. But it is a really good resource just to look at what are the limitations, um, what are the options, what are the opportunities in that space. So thanks. And I'll take questions if there are any. Thank you, Steen. Um, if you don't mind, we'll actually hold off till the end for the rest of the questions. I just put that one in there for Anik in case she has to hop off. Um, but thank you so much for sharing. I think that was a really important point that managed retreat isn't just one project and then it's done. It's it's a long-term process um, that needs to inform all long-term planning on coasts and and flood zones. Um, so yeah, John, I noticed that you raised your hand, but I'll call on you at the end after Shannon's yep. presentation. Okay. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll turn it over to Shannon to um, from the Halifax Regional Municipality to discuss 
their interest in um, in managed retreat. Awesome. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yep. And it's the full screen, right? Not the uh, presenter view? No, full screen. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for um, having me today. Um, my name is Shannon Fernandez. I am the manager of climate adaptation here at Halifax Regional Municipality in Nova Scotia. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about managed retreat. Uh, there's a little bit of overlap with what Sabine just talked about. So hopefully I'll be able to, I'll uh, zoom through a couple of those slides and get talking to why managed retreat is an important conversation that's having, that's being, that's happening, excuse me, in Nova Scotia and in um, Halifax Regional Municipality in particular. So climate change adaptation means planning for and acting on the anticipated impacts of climate change. And we know that climate change is already causing impacts such as rising seas, more frequent and severe storm events, um, increased flooding. And adaptation helps build resilience by increasing capacity to prepare and respond to climate related impacts such as natural disasters. In addition to protection and accommodation, managed retreat is a climate change adaptation approach to managing the risks and hazards, um, flooding pros to um, built infrastructure as an example. Managed retreat is a collective term for the management and mitigation tools designed to move existing and planned development out of areas at risk. Um, managed retreat is based on proactively moving out of harm's way, which is something that Sabine uh, mentioned is one of the principles of Climate Atlantic. Um, and strategies for managed retreat include abandonment, relocation, and avoidance. These strategies employ management tools such as building restrictions, setbacks, land acquisitions, which I'll talk about in particular, and disincentives to development. So abandonment can occur unexpectedly or as part of a deliberate withdrawal strategy. Historically, unplanned abandonment often follows destructive events like storms, leading to the loss of buildings and land, making reconstruction impractical. A long-term planned abandonment approach sometimes is referred to as the do-nothing strategy, involves acknowledging the fixed lifespan of infrastructure. And when the infrastructure is overcome, for example, by the sea or the lake, no effort is made to safeguard it. Alternatively, planned um, abandonment can be executed by either prohibiting post-storm reconstruction or mandating relocation um, and discouraging rebuilding after storms, which can also be achieved through other methods such as denying flood insurance and other subsidy programs. Avoidance is Avoiding hazards is the most effective method to eliminate losses of property and lives because it doesn't establish infrastructure and hazard, hazardous areas in the first place. So here, zoning plays a vital role in ensuring the secure placement of infrastructure, keeping it away from um, dangers such as coastal um, or flooding, uh, dangers through setbacks and easements. So setbacks are an avoidance management tool that aims to keep structures out of extreme to high hazard zones, or at least at a particular distance away. Um, they can be a distance from a particular reference point or adjusted, for example, as a shoreline erodes or storms impacts change. And then the focus of today's conversation is relocation. So um, relocation is a primary form of managed retreat. Active relocation is a proactive relocation of infrastructure before any threat arises um, and before it's damaged. And passive relocation entails reconstructing a demolished or damaged structure in a different area positioned away from the hazard beyond the reaches of that hazard zone. Um, the concept of long-term relocation typically involves a comprehensive strategy embedded in community zoning or land use plans. And Relocation can be applied to several types of infrastructure, including residential buildings, roads, telecommunications infrastructure, utilities, um, and so forth. One relocation managed retreat tool is a property buyout or land acquisition program, which involves relocation of high risk infrastructure via the government acquisition of property. So these programs are considered among the most effective forms of risk management since they directly reduce exposure to the hazard. Strategic relocation intentionally withdraws people from hazardous areas and relocates or demolishes buildings and infrastructure. Well-planned buyout programs can effectively eliminate flood risk to people and property, restore natural flood protection along shorelines, and open land for public recreation. And so what are the, some, what are the ways you can design a buyout program? So they can be designed in several ways, um, but the four main considerations that people need to keep in mind when planning a buyout program are compensation, timing, program approach, and government. So in terms of, comp, 
compensation. Most programs use pre-disaster property values as a baseline to calculate compensation. Sometimes they use third-party appraisals. Sometimes they're based on previous year's market value assessments or by the assessment role provided by property valuation services. Um, in some cases, the um, compensation is a fixed value um, or a value based on the square footage of the, um, of the home. So there are many different ways to structure a buyer program in terms of how much the homeowner is compensated. Um, program approach, uh, buyouts can be mandatory or voluntary. However, mandatory programs are rare since they face um, social and political opposition. As such, most buyer programs are explicitly voluntary by design, even though legal mechanisms exist in some jurisdictions for property acquisition um, under public safety. Um, so while voluntary programs are likely more palatable to residents and elected officials, they can be less efficient as, you know, Anique mentioned um, in her uh, presentation, it can lead to that Swiss cheese effect where you have um, inconsistent um, buyouts happening across a particular neighborhood. Um, timing. So this is something that uh, Sabine talked about as well. So timing, um, a major uh, event, for example, a major flood brings attention to a community's risks, opening a post-disaster window of opportunity opportunity to initiate new policies that involve significant changes in costs. And so this is a form of passive um, relocation, but still one that can help prevent future damages. Proactive programs, which are the most cost effective, um, facilitate a more systemized rollout. And this is especially important in the face of known and compounding hazards such as hurricanes, flood risk, and extreme precipitation. Lastly, and you know, perhaps most importantly, um, governance. So most programs are implemented by local level governments. However, they use provincial and federal investments. As such, implementing a buyer program requires collaboration across all levels of government. Um, the Federal Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, or DMAF, has previously funded provincial buyer programs um, across the country. And well-run efficient buyer programs require significant human and financial resources and capacity. Everything from consulting with the public to program administration to processing funding applications, managing land use planning, um, and so on. And so it is not an easy um, uh, program or an easy path to take. Next, I want to show you a video. I hope the sound works um, for about um, the 2023 flooding in Nova Scotia and why oops, and why um, the conversation regard, uh, around managed retreat started um, here in Halifax Regional Municipality. So I hope the sound works. You're good. It looked like there was a fireworks show going off for about four or five hours house shaking, crystal rattling all night long. We had about four feet of water in our basement. In a cruel twist of fate, all of the rain that Nova Scotians so desperately needed during the record-setting fire season came too late and all at once on a summer's evening on July 21st. It was the result of trading thunderstorms which hovered over the province, dropping more than 250 millimeters of rain in areas hardest hit in 24 hours. One of the biggest concerns was always, what if this happens in a city? And it just wasn't Halifax and HRM, but it was a large area. This certainly though ranks as one of the highest impact flash floods in Canadian history. The body of a 52-year-old Windsor man who had been reported missing was located by searchers in the primary search area. Four people, including two six-year-old children, were killed after becoming stranded in vehicles due to rapidly rising water. It's difficult to comprehend the, the magnitude of, of the tragedy and the loss that we're feeling. The province reported 19 bridges needed minor repairs, while 29 bridges needed more extensive repairs as a result of the flooding. Another seven bridges needed to be replaced. There were nearly 500 sections of damaged paved and gravel roads and 60 road shoulders that had to be quickly repaired by crews to keep traffic flowing, all a result of trading thunderstorms. The storm just keeps Same place, same. All right, so that was a little bit of background on the flooding. Um, here are just some images of uh, the flooding and how it impacted people's homes. 
Um, so this one shows the basement of a home on Union Street in Bedford, Nova Scotia, which is filled, which is in the Halifax Region Municipality. And this basement is filled with water after the downpours. Um, this is another building on Union Street in Bedford, which is uh, surrounded by water after the Sackville River overflowed due to the heavy rains. So Nova Scotia's Disaster Financial Assistance Program, the provincial program, is designed to help municipalities, small businesses, um, non-for-profit groups after major storms or natural disasters. So this program helps those whose losses aren't covered by insurance and can cover damages up to $200,000. In the wake of this recent extreme flooding, um, and in antici anticipation of future extreme events, um, there is the opportunity to now discuss and partner with the province of Nova Scotia on the development of a new buyout program or modify the existing provincial disaster assistance program to include buyouts. And so what did Halifax Regional Municipality do? Um, through a council motion, um, Halifax's mayor, Mayor Savage, asked the premier to develop a buyout program to purchase some of the flood prone homes on Union Street in Bedford. The planned ask of the province comes after came after um, the Bedford area councillor brought a motion forward because multiple homes on the street were flooded with over seven feet of water. The councillor said that many of the homes were built in the 1970s on what was a known floodplain, and many of the residents don't have insurance or cannot get the right kind of insurance to cover flood damage. Um, between six and 12 homes are beyond livable, according to the councillor. And so if successful, um, the Halifax Regional Municipality would commit to um, turning the um, buyout areas into green space or river walk. Um, another motion that came out of council um, was the was a letter. Oh, sorry, excuse me. As the motion that came out of council was a letter, um, I have an example here of the, the letter that Mayor Savage sent to um, the Premier asking to partner on this. And um, at the time of this presentation, we haven't heard back from the province. So um, I will end my show uh, slideshow now um, and open it up for any questions or or actually pass it back to to Maureen. Great. Thanks, Shannon. That was a, a really well prepared um, presentation. So uh, 